Um, hey everyone, I'm Sean. I also known as Twix on the internet. And today I'm going to talk about React for the backend, which I thought would be a snazzy tagline. Um, I originally said React Suspense for the backend, and I realized that nobody... I have to explain what React Suspense would be. But this is cleaner because the inspiration for this talk came from Guillermo Rausch, the creator of Next.js, uh, who actually was the first to point out that actually what we're doing to the backend infrastructure is similar to what we're doing to the front end. Um, a few caveats, our SDK right now is in alpha, so we are uh, what, the code that I'm going to show you to you is not stable. And also it's an analogy, not an actual design goal. It's just a way to explain to JavaScript developers who are most likely familiar with React. Um, and the question comes from, I see a lot of this on YouTube, which is essentially that you, <laughs> you'll, you'll have like this, this guy, a live streamer, a content creator, say, you know, how we, we'll, we'll make a full stack Uber clone. Uh, and it is full stack in, in some sense, but they often leave out, like it's very easy to do the UI, uh, but they often leave out anything with the backend. And so for example, uh, you know, the, the actual sort of backend parts of Uber uh, involves search, involves pricing, involves matching, pickup, drop off, reading, tipping, payments, email, um, and really, that's just the happy path because you're going from system to system to system. Now imagine each of these is a separate team. Um, and the naive way to implement this is that once you're done with one, you kind of go on to the next thing. Uh, but really then you've, you've also left out a lot of the other edge cases and ways in which uh, things can change along the way because this is a long running job. And actually a lot of the processes in every company is a long running job. And our technology actually is not very, not very good at handling long running jobs. So often when we talk about full stack clones, so we talk about people who are full stack, it's often like this, like heavy on the front and fairly light on the back. And actually when you investigate these backend systems, they can be microservices death stars like that, uh, because that's just how you scale these backends and also how you scale the engineering. And I think that's just a really interesting observation that um, the way that you handle this is instead of um, what is called choreography, you do... Uh, you add in certain amount of retries and, and uh, timeouts because every time you cross system boundaries, that is a chance of failure and you need to accommodate and compensate for network failures and system failures. And every time you do that, that actually causes, it causes extra infrastructure. So you do that enough, you actually start wanting to centralize um, all of this infrastructure to a central layer. And that is my sort of very brief description of orchestration, why you need a central team that handles all this coordination and then each of these systems can uh, work independently and not be coupled to each other. So uh, that's a short explainer of choreography versus orchestration. If you want more information about that, uh, I highly recommend this blog post from theburningmonk.com, uh, Yan Tsui, who goes into a little bit more detail about why, when and why you might want uh, one of each. But we are an orchestration platform. And actually, I, I find it very similar to what React did for the front end in the sense that we used to um, essentially not have much organization of our code. Um, and React gave us components where we had a central orchestrator, which is the React renderer, React DOM. And then we organized our code into components. And that helped us to, to tie up event handlers and render functions uh, with the central state orchestration. So I really like that analogy and I was seeing how far we can stretch it. Um, but essentially, this is the kind of way you start to approach things in terms of how you scale front ends, right? Like if you want to, if you want to organize your code on the front end, you use React. If you want to organize your code in the back end, you start to use orchestration. Okay, so uh, let's dive into a little bit of code. This is some. This is the first time, by the way, uh, anywhere I've ever shown in public uh, the API that we're that we're about to launch. So I, I'm, I really appreciate some feedback. But also I think it be it has some similar parallels to React um, in the sense that a workflow function, this is how we do our core business logic, is just a function. Uh, similar similarly to how React is just a function, um, and then you render it in React. Uh, well, for us, you don't actually render; there's nothing to render to, but you can create a client and then you can start that workflow. Um, then to do something, to do side effects in a real world, you, call, you, you write another function. Again, this is just a function here. I'm charging you know, some amount by Stripe. Um, and that's something, that's just a function again that you call inside of your workflow. So um, you separate these two things into workflows and activities. Um, why do you want to separate them? And why, why this kind of weird API? Because both of these things are just functions. The reason is because Activities have a special rule, which is that they are automatically enabled with retries and timeouts. So, um, and whenever you call an activity, activity like 
uh, for example, you want to charge an API, um, you can you can configure declaratively all these timeouts, and you can configure all these retries, and that actually creates a better user experience because if you have a temporary failure or downtime, um, you can actually control how that user experience gracefully degrades. Um, but this also means that as you code, these timers and these retries and this the the tracking of the state of the retries is all done for you by a framework that's running behind the scene, and that's that's. Uh, the core benefit. But since you have a timer, why not actually expose the timer? So, um, you know, for example, if I wanted to code an installment pay, uh, uh, amount, uh, sorry, an installment workflow, I could take an amount divided by two, charge Stripe, wait for 30 days, and then continue charging Stripe. Uh, and the reason that this is uh, doable is because the framework that, or the, the runtime that we offer you, um, I can actually um, run this code and then sleep and then wake up again in 30 days and continue. And that actually unlocks a very interesting programming pattern where actually we don't really care about the function exiting or we can just say while true and that's a subscription. If you want to do monthly billing, um, you can just say while true, charge some amounts and then sleep for certain amounts um, and you can just keep looping and if you ever need to cancel, you can cancel that workflow externally. There's an API for that. Um, that's fine and all, uh, all and good, but also you want to probably want to send information in while this thing is running because we're we're working on a long running process. Uh, so the final API I'm going to show you is how to signal an API. And so uh, here we're going to define a signal called an update signal. And whenever that update comes in to update the amount, we can upgrade the amount that's being charged every single month. And that's a that's a very interesting and simple system to code some fairly long running processes, and you can apply that to a lot of different things. And what uh, what Temporal offers as well is, is a immutable history of all the events that went through. So this solves the observability problem. If anything goes wrong or if you need to audit the state of that, um, I think that's this is a really good system to uh, understand uh, what happened. And that's a little bit also what React does. It um, you know applies a series of updates um, in, in a chain, um, especially with React Fiber. Okay, so what is Temporal? Temporal is the open source platform for orchestrating highly reliable mission critical applications at scale. That's freaking wordy. I gotta cut that down. But uh, essentially it is coming out of Uber. That's how that's why I opened with the Uber explanation because uh, our co-founders started this project at Uber, open sourced it, and it got a lot of adoption at a bunch of places like Box, Descript, Snapchat, Coinbase, uh, Datadog. Uh, a bunch of people are hiring for this as well. Um, if you ever want to get a job doing that. And actually our at our most recent meetup, uh, we had Netflix presenting about how they're using us for CICD, which ties in to uh, <laughs> the previous talk, um, which is which is pretty cool. I think uh, when you have something that is just generally reinventing asynchronous programming, you can apply it to a lot of different things. And I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, I'm going to skip this because we don't have time. I'm going to and, and this you can read in my blog post, which uh, I'm going to send to you in the chat if you want to check it out. Uh, but essentially, the, the main thing I want to focus on is the programming model. Uh, we're not the first workflow engine that uh, has ever existed. These are screenshots of all the other workflow engines. They're usually boxes and arrows or DAGs or sort of represented by JSON and YAML uh, charts. The problem with these is that you're, you're basically reinventing or handwriting the abstract syntax tree of something that is probably a general programming language. So here is the format, the syntax for Google workflows, and here's the exact equivalent in JavaScript. And I think uh, we can probably all agree that it's much, much easier to, to read JavaScript, test JavaScript, and use all the standard tooling uh, to write these things. So that's something that uh, we emphasize very strongly as well. Um, we provide the, the temporal server to host the runtime, um, dev tools to inspect the state, and then SDKs for whatever language you want to offer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I draw a lot of inspiration from React, and I, I kind of see the parallels here that um, you want to organize your coding components, and then you have a centralized renderer in the same way that we want you to organize workflows, uh, all your, all your backend code into workflows, and then have a central orchestrator. Uh, the correctness model is also very similar. We use event sourcing to um, to resume from any failures. And a programming model, uh, React just wants you to learn JavaScript instead of a custom syntax, uh, and so do we. So um, I, there's a lot more that I could not go into, but, and, and you know, feel free to hit me up. Uh, there's just way too much for a lightning talk. But I just want to show you like the amount of parallels, and these are all convergent evolution. Our founders did not uh, know anything about React, but me as a React developer coming in, I was like, oh my god, there's so much uh, parallels, and because we're trying to solve similar problems on the back end. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, check out temporal.io slash node. That's kind of what the, the URL is for now uh, for trying out the Hello World, and thank you.